We're beginning a series this morning in the life of Moses, and it's going to take just a little more than two months to go through this, though we could go a lot longer if we wanted to. And uh, I think when most people think about Moses, what they think about is a person who was responsible to give the law and bring judgment. And so our tendency of looking in the Old Testament is that God was angry then, and then when he got to the New Testament, he got over it. And we're, we're, we don't think that grace is anything that happens until Jesus shows up. But actually, the Old Testament is filled with stories of and pictures of grace. And so I'd like us to look at the life of Moses to, to, to notice some of those opportunities of grace that were so brilliantly displayed in his life and I think can be encouraging to us. So I really have two goals in this series. Uh, one is that you would be able to expect and spot grace in our world. I think a lot of people don't expect grace and they can miss it because it doesn't look like what they expected it to. And then secondly, my second goal is that a lot of the stories surrounding Moses, things were as bad as they could possibly get, as dark as it could possibly be. And yet God provided a remarkable way in the midst of all of that. And so my second goal in this series is that not only would we be able to spot grace, but we would also anticipate and be on the lookout for a, a path, a direction that God gives us, even if we're in a very difficult and dark time. So we're going to begin in Exodus the first chapter and the eighth verse and it says there was a new king that means Pharaoh to whom Joseph meant nothing he came to power in Egypt look he said to his people the Israelites have become far too numerous for us come we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out will join our enemies fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they build Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and, and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives. By the way, in case you're wondering, they made that up. Okay. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave the order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. It had been roughly 400 years since Joseph and his family had made their original trip down to Egypt, and there were 70 of them at that point. But over the course of over 400 years, their population had grown tremendously. Uh, they had increased a lot, and uh, uh, the, I mean, Egypt was really uh, the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And there was a lot of certainly religious worship that was involved in the Egyptian system. But of course, anytime you have uh, religion that is not healthy or spirituality that is not healthy, it's very easy to become suspicious of and opposed to other people groups. And so Pharaoh saw the uh, increasing population of Israel as something to be alarmed about. 
And so he developed what was really a, a three-part strategy to control the population of Israel. And the first was is to treat them even more ruthlessly and brutally. He would just work them. So his assumption was is if, if we get everything out of them in their day, they won't have anything to give their spouse at night. It's kind of like that. And, and then uh, he also developed another uh, strategy as, as we go along, and that is this was a covert strategy, a secret strategy. And that's where he went to the midwives and he told them, when you're helping the Hebrew women give birth, if it's a boy, make it look like the child didn't survive. If it's a girl, allow the child to survive. And of course, the midwives uh, did not participate in that. And then the third uh, strategy that Pharaoh developed was... Uh, to have to command his people to throw the baby boys that were born into the Nile River. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, I grew up hearing that that was the order that he gave Israel, that they had to do this to their own children. But it says to his people he gave this order. And it doesn't even specify that it is um, uh, military. He just so increased the fear of people about Israel that mobs would form and they would do, well, what you expect mobs to do. And we forget sometimes that if you are afraid enough, you are capable of anything, the worst atrocity you can possibly imagine. We should always be suspicious when someone is trying to make us afraid because the likelihood that we can step outside of bounds is significant. Remember last, two weeks ago, we talked about this. God has called us to peace. He's called us to peace, not to fear. To peace. And so uh, the, the, the midwife said that the, the Hebrew women just give birth really fast. And, and, uh, and what's interesting, it says God gave them families of their own, which is an indication they didn't have families of their own. In fact, that's kind of how they became midwives is because they didn't have families to take care of. They would help other women who were giving birth. And so anybody who has struggled with the whole issue of, of not being able to have children, uh, you would know what, what a what an ongoing burden and, and the kind of breaking of a heart that that creates. But so out of there, it's really remarkable, out of their own sense of loss, they were helping others. It's an amazing thing. But when Pharaoh wanted uh, uh, them to be responsible for the death of boys, they refused. And, and God's response to them, because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh, God's response was to give them families of their own. What an incredibly gracious thing to do. And so, uh, in case you're wondering why this is happening to Israel, Israel had actually not done anything to deserve this. They'd not uh, in any way planned attacks against Egypt. They had not stolen anything or taken things inappropriately. They, they were just becoming, even though they were a huge economic benefit to the system of Egypt, they were also a threat because of their numbers. And so Pharaoh had decided he was going to eliminate as best he could that threat and still benefit from the economic realities. Uh, that takes us into Exodus chapter two, where it says, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when he saw that it, he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Her sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister uh, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him and when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Pharaoh's plan for 
controlling the population was killing the boys. It never occurred to him that the greatest threat to his plans would actually come from the girls. It's just amazing how foolish human beings can be. But when you think about it, uh, the, 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 um, the women who were uh, helping the birthing, uh, Shifra and Pua, uh, they neutralized his secret plan, right? And, and, and it was, it was the, the, the Moses' uh, mother who hid Moses. That, that's a woman who put him in a little, she, she turned a, a little basket into a boat by making it waterproof and setting it down in the water. And, uh, and, and she worked against his plan. And then Moses' sister is standing off at the distance and she's the one who actually connected Pharaoh's daughter and Moses' mother, and there's actually economic support. I mean, when you think about it, uh, Pharaoh didn't think he had anything to fear from the females of the Israelites, and yet they are the ones who God used in this story. Uh, the mother of uh, Moses hid her newborn baby as long as she could. At three months, she couldn't hide him any, any longer. And so, because these mobs were running wild. And when someone goes to take something from you as precious as a child, you can't imagine the kind of danger that puts a family in. I hope I'm never in a situation where I have to make a choice like that. And so she places Moses in this, this tiny boat that she made. She takes it to the river to hide it. The daughter of Pharaoh is coming down to the Nile to bathe. And she sees, she notices the basket. And she has one of her servants go out and get it. And they open it up. And there's this little baby and it's crying. And for some reason her heart is moved. This is what else is interesting. God doesn't just use the midwives and God doesn't just use Moses' mother and God doesn't just use Moses' sister. God uses Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> and so she winds up feeling something for this child and makes arrangement not only for his survival but for his support and eventually he becomes her son and and so the sister of Moses is standing off in the distance and 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 she goes do you, do you need a nurse yes okay isn't that just like God to arrange those things together uh, Pharaoh's daughter had no idea the nature of the relationship that already existed no one knew what God was doing no one and he's using who he wants to bring freedom. This is an important thing for us to remember. He was using who he wants to bring freedom. No one would notice a sister who's standing off in a distance. No one would notice a mother who's leaving something in the water. No one would notice a woman who's walking alongside the bank. It looks from a human perspective like absolutely nothing is happening, but the entire power structure of the greatest uh, government on the planet at that time is being undone. The threads of a system of slavery are being pulled, and when it's done, they are going to be a free people. That is phenomenal. It is amazing. A lot of times we think God can only use certain people. Our attention is always drawn to the strong and the attention getters and the well-networked and the well-researched. And we assume those are the people who fix things. Those are the people who change things. Those are the people who make the difference in our world. Nobody notices the woman bending over at the bank. Nobody notices someone walking into the water for a swim. Nobody notices a young girl standing at the sideline. And yet those are the people God is doing to undo us system of slavery that existed for 400 years. That's amazing. It's amazing. The question is, I wonder who God is using today. Who did you pass today? You didn't even notice. Because they don't get a million views on YouTube. They're not the one that people are talking about or all excited about or all angry about. They go completely unnoticed. And yet someone is turning a basket into a boat and someone is looking for ways to connect one person with another person and another person's heart is being moved. And those are the people God is using to make incredible changes and bring grace into our world. And not just our world, but what about yours? 
We keep waiting for the company to give us the job we want, the school to give us the acceptance we want, the person to say yes to our proposal, and somehow this is going to transform our lives. And it's often the people that we're not even noticing that are making the biggest difference. Do you know what that's called? Grace. Grace. Is there anybody in the house that's grateful for the grace of God? Grateful for the grace of God. Yes. And not only does he help the poor and powerless, he uses the poor and the powerless. It's just absolutely astonishing. God chooses who he uses. Absolutely amazing. Let's continue on. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them in their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to Midian, where he sat down by a well. God chooses who he uses, and God chooses what he won't use. God chooses what he won't use. This is also a picture of grace. Moses is now a full-grown man. His heritage has not been hidden from him. He knows he is a Hebrew. And Moses, is out, he goes out and he's walking through and he's, he's seeing how the Hebrews are being treated. This wasn't hidden. This wasn't secret. It was done out in the open. This is what the culture believed was perfectly normal. This is how you treated Hebrew people. And something inside of him, when he saw the cruelty and he saw the barbarianism and he saw the inhumanity, something inside of him snapped. He wasn't able to take it anymore. It was inconsistent with anything that he thought could be human in any way. And something just snaps. And so he looks all around to make sure no one is watching. And then he rises up and he kills the Egyptian. It's intentional. It's deliberate. He's going to end this brutal behavior at least for one person. And he kills him. And then he hit him in the sand. If this were a movie, this is where you would expect all of the Hebrews to rally around him. He's their vigilante hero. He rose up against the Egyptian. Let's follow him. After all, what he did, wasn't it justified? Wasn't it right? Wasn't he bringing justice to an unjust situation? And they could just rally around him. This is where you get the cheers in the movie theater. You turn this guy into a superhero. You make little tiny dolls for our children to play with. You make cartoons out of them. This is the guy that's going to right all the wrongs. Look at what he did. The next day, he's out walking around again. Why? He's looking for someone else. He's going to bring justice one more time. He senses inside of him, not only is this wrong, but maybe I'm supposed to do something about it. And this is the strategy that he is employing. But while he's out looking around, there are two Hebrews who are fighting, and one is just beating the daylights out of the other. And he tells them, why are you doing this to each other? He goes to the one who's responsible, the one who's wrong. And that guy just looks at him and says, who made you ruler over us? Which is funny because that's what's going to happen to Moses. He is going to be the ruler over them. What he discovers is that what he had done wasn't hidden at all. They were aware of the death of the Egyptian. I think he knew deep down inside he was supposed to make a difference. What he did not understand was that God will not use our anger and our violence to bring freedom to our world. Why is that? Because God doesn't just want to break chains. God wants to change hearts. 
and a new system of government built around vigilantism might get them out of Egypt, but it will make them as brutal as anything that they ever endured at the hands of the Egyptians. And God is after not just their freedom from the slave and the taskmasters. He wants freedom in their heart. He wants to transform their heart. This is what it says. I'm sure you've heard this verse in James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Hearts are not changed by anger or by rejection or by disrespect. Hearts will not be changed by hiding. God doesn't use hiding and violence. That's a picture of grace. Sometimes humans find themselves in a situation where they have no options except violence. You can't put God in a situation like that. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If you want to memorize a verse of scripture, there's a good one. Our hearts are not changed by hiding. Anger, violence, rejection, this is not a picture of grace. Our, our hearts can be changed, though, when we stop making excuses for what we've done and we stop hiding our sin and we start confessing it. It's when we bring our sins and our anger and our frustration and our faults and our failures out of the darkness and out from under the sand and we bring it into the light that that's when the grace of God is able to cleanse and forgive. This is also a verse of scripture worth memorizing if you haven't done it already. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. What is this telling us? It's a picture of grace. God uses who he chooses. And that could be you. You don't see yourself as a mover and a shaker. You don't see yourself as someone who makes a difference in our world. Most of what you do is unnoticed even by the people who love you the most. That's no limitation to God. God uses who he chooses. I can't do anything significant. A woman waterproofing a basket didn't think that was significant either. A young girl standing a little ways off watching what's going on didn't think that was significant either. A woman who is of royalty, you would think that's significant, but what is she doing? She's going to take a swim in the Nile River. And in those moments, God was at work. I mean, really, did you ever think God was doing something significant when you went to the beach? <laughs> it's a picture of grace. But in our culture, in our world, not just America, globally, there's this increased tension to become angry about the things that are not as they should be. And we want to take matters into our hands. We want to strike back and strike down those things that don't agree with us, that don't look like us, that don't sound like us. And that's not a picture of grace. That's just another picture of dominance. So what does God say? God says to Moses, that's not something that I can use, but I absolutely love this. That doesn't, God doesn't say, that's not a person I can't use. I just can't use these strategies. He's going to have to take Moses and he's going to have to relocate him far away from Egypt, put him in Midian, and he's going to spend 40 years with a bunch of sheep. And by the time that he's done, the anger is gone and the resentment is gone. And this sense of, I can make a difference all by myself is gone. And who he becomes is a person God can use to bring freedom to an entire nation. It's a picture of grace. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you are the one putting the basket in the water. 
Maybe you are the one watching from afar. Maybe you are the one just going for a swim and you can't imagine how God can use any of this. Or maybe you're the one who's struggling with bondage that you can't imagine a day of freedom, much less a life of freedom. And you can't imagine how God is ever gonna fix this in your life. And here's what I want you to know. Right now, God is using people you haven't even noticed to start pulling the threads that will undo the chains that have kept you bound and in darkness so far in your life. You're about to experience freedom and it's because of His grace. So Father, let your grace flow freely into our lives and through our lives. In the name of your mighty Son, Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.